Good afternoon. It is Wednesday the 29th. It's about 2 p.m. in the afternoon and I'm here to talk to you about this week's lectures, Andrew Jackson and the Antebellum North. I'm going to try to keep it short as always so that you'll actually watch these. And I'm just going to kind of go over the main events that are going on because I know you guys can read this, the slides and I know you guys can read the book. So let's get started here. When we talk about Andrew Jackson, uh, you have to actually talk about the election of 1824. It's not an election that Andrew Jackson won, but it's really going to set up um, this disagreement between two people. Now, the election of 1824, it's the first election since 1800 with multiple people running. You've got John Quincy Adams, who is the son of President Number 2, John Adams. You've got Henry Clay, who is from Kentucky. You have William Crawford, who is from Georgia, and Andrew Jackson, who's from Tennessee. In the election of 1824, Andrew Jackson gets the most votes. He also gets the most electoral college votes. You can see the numbers there, 43% of the popular vote and 38% of the electoral college vote. When you actually put that to paper or to, um, to real numbers, what you get Andrew Jackson 99 electoral college votes John Quincy Adams 89 William Crawford got 41 and Henry Clay got 37 because nobody actually received enough electoral college votes the election is going to be decided by Congress and when it's all said and done Henry Clay drops out of the race Andrew Jackson does not win the presidency, John Quincy Adams does, and Henry Clay is going to become the Secretary of State for, uh, for President Adams. So there's a lot of questions surrounding this election, a lot of questions by Andrew Jackson himself and his supporters. Um, <clears throat> but John Quincy Adams is president, He's a very ineffective president. He underestimates how much the people dislike a strong national government. He completely underestimates the idea that people want tariffs. He completely just kind of underestimates the popularity of Andrew Jackson. So uh, that four year period from 1825 to 1829, John Quincy Adams, not, not well liked. A lot of people ask who Andrew Jackson is. Uh, he's from North Carolina. He was a war hero. He served in the War of 1812, and it's Andrew Jackson who stopped the British from taking over New Orleans. By trade, he was a lawyer. He taught himself law when he was a young teenager. And he liked to drink, and he liked to fight, and he liked to gamble. He was pretty rough. You also see here it says he was married to a woman named Rachel. There's a whole story about Rachel. Uh, she was married before she met Andrew Jackson and uh, her first husband abused her and her kids. So Rachel left husband number one, moved in with Andrew Jackson and Andrew Jackson's mom. Andrew Jackson being the lawyer he was, sent papers off to the husband to get him to agree to a divorce. Andrew and Rachel never thought anything of it. They get married. Well, it turns out that husband number one never actually signed the paperwork. So Rachel's married to not one, but two men. And that controversy is going to follow around Andrew Jackson uh, throughout much of his political career. When we get to the election of 1828, it's going to be John Quincy Adams versus Andrew Jackson round two. And the election of 1828, this is the true beginning of partisan politics. This is when political parties really get going. First thing to know, this is going to be a personal election. Rachel is going to die. Jackson is going to blame Rachel's death on John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams is going to call Andrew Jackson a womanizer and a, a bigamist and all these other things. And then there's this guy in the background named Martin Van Buren who is going to provide the money for Andrew Jackson's election campaign. In the second round, 
Jackson wins 178 to 83 Electoral College votes. He gets roughly 55-56% of the popular vote. And he wins because it's a combination of people really disliking John Quincy Adams and people feeling bad for Andrew Jackson. So uh, in the end, he does win. Now Jackson's philosophy of government, you can see it here. He preferred agriculture. He preferred agrarian societies. Uh, he preferred smaller government. He preferred state government over federal government. Uh, he said strong government is bad. He believed in individualism and individual rights. He thought people having too much economic power and too much political power was a bad thing. And he also thought that giving people reforms was bad too. He disliked reformers' calls for government intervention because he, th he thought that reforms would restrict individual freedoms. But if you look at this picture here, he is dressed up like a king. And that's largely because his governing philosophy didn't actually match what he said he would do. Now there are some problems under Andrew Jackson. One of them is this thing called the nullification controversy. In 1888, there is a very high tariff passed that is supposed to discourage the sale of foreign goods inside the United States. Basically, it's to reduce the availability of British goods. Problem is, the South, and especially South Carolina, they thought that this was a tax passed to punish them because they preferred to use British goods. Well, the vice president, John C. Calhoun, is going to um, write a, an essay, basically a pamphlet, called Exposition and Protest. And in this essay, John C. Calhoun, the vice president, is going to say that the tariff was unconstitutional, that any state had the right to declare an act of government unconstitutional, and any state had the right to declare an act of the government void. And he called this the idea of nullification. You could nullify or ignore a law. Then he said, if you nullify a law, that means that a state is also willing to secede from the union. So if a state's willing to go against the federal government and nullify a law, a state is also willing to go against the union and leave. And he says that South Carolina is ready to go. In the end, this opens up a really big argument. Um, Southerners are for states' rights. They say the U.S. is made up of separate states and these separate states can nullify laws. Northerners are for federal authority. They say only the Supreme Court can declare a law unconstitutional. So you have one side who's saying that the United States is a group of states that have voluntarily come together. The other side is saying that the United States is a group of people who have come together. So it's two completely different ways to look at the United States. Andrew Jackson and John C. Calhoun, they make their positions regarding this controversy known. It turns out they're on opposite sides, and Jackson becomes extremely disliked in the South because Southerners feel like he has chosen to side with those in the North. John C. Calhoun gets so upset about this that he actually resigns from being vice president and ends up getting elected to uh, government as a senator in 1832. Another event that happens while Jackson is president is the Peggy Eaton affair. This was in 1830-1831. Uh, I could go on a really long story, but I know you're not that interested. Uh, basically, Peggy Eaton, she uh, gets married. She then cheats on her husband while her husband is serving as a U.S. sailor in the Navy. And the husband finds out about this cheating and commit suicide. Peggy gets married to the guy she was having an affair with who just happened to be a senator 
And this, for some reason, reminds Andrew Jackson of his wife, Rachel. And basically, Andrew Jackson says, you have to accept Peggy and her new husband because I say so. Well, a lot of people had a problem with that because they didn't they knew about the affair they knew that the circumstances around the death were questionable and um, things don't go so well Andrew Jackson's cabinet resigns Andrew Jackson's daughter quits being first lady and Martin Van Buren is going to come out better out of this because he's going to eventually become the vice president Andrew Jackson had some problems with money uh, in in regards to the second national bank <clears throat> it started in 1816 and was working like a clearinghouse for state banks uh, most state banks didn't like the national bank they didn't like the fact that the national bank had power over them and they thought that it was fairly unresponsive to what their local needs were uh, however Congress renews the charter for the bank early in 1832 they send the charter for the bank to Andrew Jackson and Jackson instead of signing the bill to make the National Bank permanent he vetoes the bill and he says I'm vetoing the bill because I don't agree with it I don't like it and that's gonna be the first time a president vetoed a bill on grounds other than it being unconstitutional he attacked the bank as being undemocratic. He said that it gave some special privilege and it get, put the economic power into the hands of a few. Jackson then proceeds to completely kill the bank by depositing federal funds into his favorite state chartered banks. So a bank with no money is broke. We also have the species circular issue. In 1836, Andrew Jackson's worried about speculation on, on public lands. Basically, people come in buy the land super cheap and then they resell it at a huge profit uh, so Jackson issues the species circular which said that only gold or silver would be acceptable payments for federal lands nobody had gold and silver the amount of land being purchased goes way down uh, people are are wanting gold and silver coins which means state banks need to come up with gold and silver coins and then the only way they can do that is by asking people to pay their loans and guess what people didn't have money to pay their loans so this credit crunch that happens is going to kill the entire economy and there's going to be a res recession once andrew jackson is out of power The dislike for Andrew Jackson is going to lead to the birth of a brand new political party called the Whig Party. The Whig Party are going to be the leftover of the, um, the Jeffersonian Republicans. It's going to be a group of people who are anti-Freemason because Jackson was a Freemason. And this is going to be a party that is directly opposed to everything that Andrew Jackson is for. Andrew Jackson's for small government. They want big government. Andrew Jackson is, is for uh, not doing any reforms. They're pro-activist. Uh, Andrew Jackson, state bank should have the power. They want a national bank. So this is the anti-Andrew Jackson party. When we get to the 1836 election, Andrew Jackson does not run for a third term, but his hand-picked guy, Martin Van Buren, does. The Whigs are going to put three candidates up against Martin Van Buren. A guy named Daniel Webster, Willie Person Mangum, Hugh White, and William Henry Harrison. This split vote means that Van Buren wins. Van Buren gets four years as president. Van Buren continues this idea of using gold and silver. Uh, he he makes the depression continue all the way on until 1843 and really you can think of martin van buren's presidency as andrew jackson part three when we get to 1840 the Whigs have smartened up a little bit they only have one candidate run that's william henry harrison uh, he was a war hero from the war of 1812 
He becomes president at the age of 68, William Henry Harrison does. And to prove that he was still young, uh, he gave a two hour long speech once he's inaugurated and sworn in. It starts to rain, he gets sick, and he dies of typhoid fever exactly one month after he becomes president. The other topic for today has to do with the antebellum North. And antebellum is really just a fancy way of saying before the war. All right, one thing that you should know about the antebellum North is that the 40 year period before the Civil War, more urbanization than the country has ever seen. People are constantly moving into the cities because that is where the jobs are. New York City will become the first city in the country with more than a million people when Brooklyn becomes part of the country, or I should say of the city. In the cities, housing is crowded. There are no high rises. There's no public water. Uh, you have to get it from private companies or a public source. No sewer systems. Volunteer fire, volunteer police. Uh, there's some private police companies, or and there's some private fire companies, but you, of course, need to pay them to, if your house is on fire. And then everybody is going to theater. Everybody's watching uh, baseball, horse racing, boxing, bicycling. There are some sports clubs, Freemason clubs, uh, urban clubs like that. And then there are a lot of street performers and there are a lot of political rallies that everybody goes to. So that's kind of what you're doing in the city at the time. This is a time where you live apart from work for the first time. You're no longer working at home. You're no longer working in your, your house or your own place. You are going somewhere to work. Uh, the wealthy, those who have money, are going to move away from the cities because they want to move away from the pollution. They want to move away from the noise, the people, the immigrants, the poor, you name it. They want to live by themselves. There's a lot of wealth inequality. And you get your first instances of mass production. Now, I'm not talking mass production like assembly lines or anything like that. This is just unskilled labor doing the same job over and over and over again. That's where that specialization of labor I mentioned before, um, you know, a week or two ago comes in. There are changes in the countryside as well. People such as John Deere are inventing the steel-tipped plow. John Deere did not invent the tractor. The steel-tipped plow is what he invented, and that allowed farming to begin in the Midwest. Cyrus McCormick is going to invent the mechanical reaper, which allowed wheat and barley and other grains to be harvested much quicker more easily and more efficiently. Chemical fertilizers going to increase the amount of food that can be grown and then railroads will let farmers get their goods to market before their goods go bad. Now, railroads and canals and the beginning of agriculture in the Midwest those are what make the cities of Chicago and Milwaukee so important. <clears throat> Even today in 2022, Chicago and Milwaukee are two of the most important cities in our country. Now, completely making a left turn, we have this idea of true womanhood and the cult of domesticity. There was this movement, and this is like the anti uh, low mill workers movement. So this is what people who who um, look down on the mill workers or maybe once were mill workers and left that way of life were looking for. To be a true woman, there were four cardinal virtues. There was piety, purity, submissiveness, and domesticity. Now, piety is centered around religion. It was said religion is exactly what a woman needs for it gives her that dignity that best suits her dependence. A woman is supposed to be 
uh, religious and pious and good and all these other things. Purity. Terrible consequences befall women who lose their purity before marriage. Women were supposed to be pure, no sex before marriage, and if you were caught having sex, then you could go mad, you could get sick, you could lose your child, other things, what they believed. In true womanhood, the idea of submissiveness was the most feminine virtue. A woman was expected to submit to her husband or her father or whoever the, the man of the house was. And then there's domesticity. <clears throat> it was said that a woman's true place was at her fireside, and she was to provide a haven of purity and comfort to men struggling in the wicked public world. Basically, a good woman is supposed to be a homemaker who did what her husband told without question and had dinner ready on the table when the husband came home from work. That's what true womanhood was about in the 1830s, 1840s. It's all about religion. It's all about education, having good morals, having good domestic skills, and being cultured. There are movies, mag not movies, but magazines, books, sermons. Um, there are people speaking about this. Three women who speak about this. Um, Catherine Beecher. She was a teacher who thought it was a school's responsibility to teach moral, physical, and intellectual development of children. Uh, she was also the person who was most responsible for adding kindergarten to education. Sarah Josepha Hale, she was an author. She helped make Thanksgiving a national holiday. She advocated for the education of women and children. She's also the one who wrote Mary Had a Little Lamb. And when you look at Mary Had a Little Lamb in regards to the cult of domesticity, it has a completely different meaning. Mary Had a Little Lamb. She's being a domestic. She's taking care of the lamb. The lamb's fleece is white as snow. The lamb is purity. You get the idea. <clears throat> and then Lydia Sigourney, she was a poet, and she wrote about... Um, grace religious life inspired other women to become poets and she was all about this idea of true womanhood as for the publications uh Godey's ladybook it was a pretty big circulating magazine it had like 150,000 subscribers that's where mary had a little lamb was first published and it was all about women and poetry articles true womanhood etc etc uh, the Ladies' Repository, that was a monthly magazine put out by the Methodist Church. Then it was called the Methodist Episcopal Church, but it's the Methodist Church. And it was about literature, art, Methodism, poetry, and it was geared towards women. Then finally, the Young Ladies' Book, that contained formal instructions like how to curtsy properly, how to walk, how to place your feet when you're standing. It's basically a how-to manual to to the idea of true womanhood. <clears throat> a couple other changes regarding women. Uh, there are smaller families. There is the use of birth control. There is the use of abortion. And women are going to completely remove themselves from economics. Economics will become a um, something that the man of the house will do for a good 50 to 100 years before that starts to change again. Now what's really interesting about this is you don't really find the cult of domesticity in the South. It's almost exclusively a Northern thing. And that's because in the South, women will still hold a very important role in the agricultural business running plantations, etc., etc. <clears throat> now lastly, we have some religious movements and some reform movements. The religious movement that you need to know about is the Second Great Awakening. And this happens in the early 1800s going up until the 1830s. Uh, these are na nationwide revivals. In fact, Charles Finney from New York, he comes up with the idea of a revival. 
and Charles Finney is going to pray for people by name and allow people to to join his church right away. Lyman Beecher is going to preach against alcohol and he's going to start the anti-alcohol movement. Um, it's really just this attempt to reignite religion in the United States and it gives rise to the Methodists, the Baptists, and it also is going to give rise to this group, the Mormons. Now Mormons were founded by Joseph Smith in Rochester, New York. Uh, Joseph Smith uh, he grew up in Rochester, New York, in, and in Rochester, for whatever reason, that was the, the headquarters, if you will, of the Second Great Awakening. Now, Smith based his new religion on what he claimed was a newly found book of the Bible, the Book of Mormon. His church becomes the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he quickly gains followers, he quickly gains enemies, and he's moving further and further west to escape persecution. In 1843, Smith creates even more controversy by claiming that polygamy was, was okay and the idea of polygamy was revealed to him. And then in 1844, the Mormons have made it as far as Western Illinois when Smith is put in jail for charges of treason. And while he's in jail, uh, he and his brother are busted out and then murdered by a mob. There's a group of religious people known as Shakers. Uh, they start in the late 1700s, but they exist through uh, basically the Civil War. And I've recently discovered that there are two groups of Shakers still active in the United States. Uh, well, who were the Shakers? Uh, they were centered in upstate New York. <clears throat> they strongly believed in the idea of perfectionism. They strongly believed in surrendering all of their property to the community so they didn't have any individual ownership. And they felt that they could bring the millennial kingdom of heaven. So the actual kingdom of heaven will come to earth and they will join it. <clears throat> Not religious, but um, still a utopian movement, a special movement of the time. The Transcendentalists. The Transcendentalists, they get their ideas from British Romantic writers. So if you've ever had British lit and you've talked about Romanticism, that's where these guys fit in. Uh, Transcendentalism, uh, it embraced the theory of the individual where they said that there was a distinction between reason and understanding. Uh, reason was your ability to grasp beauty and truth. Reason was your ability to give full expression to your emotions. And then understanding was, oh, how do I want to say it, using subjective analysis. So you, you don't use empirical data, you don't use scientific reasoning, you use subjective analysis. So your understanding of the world is very much based on the individual. Leaders of the Transcendentalist movement were Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Bronson Alcott, a lot of people that you see in American literature if you've had that class. By 1841, a lot of these Transcendentalists, they decide to do this experimental community in, in Massachusetts, and they decide that they're going to create a new society where everybody has the chance to um, work together and then everybody would get to enjoy the fruits of their labor together. Now tensions start very quickly. They realize that some people want to enjoy the fruits of their, of their labor more than they want to actually grow the fruit. Eventually in 1847 a fire breaks out and they decide after the farm is destroyed that they don't want to rebuild it. It's not worth their time. Reform movements. Uh, this is the beginning of temperance. Uh, there is a big anti-alcohol movement that breaks out in the first half of the 1800s. It's supported by employers. It's supported by church. And it's going to lead to the idea of prohibition when we get to the 1900s and also today in many communities in in the south you cannot buy alcohol on sundays that's actually 
uh, remaining leftover from these temperance movements. The woman you see in this picture, that is Dorothea Dix. Uh, Dor Dorothea Dix, she got her start in Massachusetts and she would tour facilities for the insane. She would tour prisons and she discovered that people were confined to cages, kept in closets, they were chained up, they were naked, they were beaten. Uh, and Dorothea Dix goes back to the Massachusetts government and says, look, this is what I found. We need to have trained attendants set up that knows how to treat these people the right way. And Dorothea Dix is going to start this movement where eventually humane treatment will come to inmates of public facilities, uh, people who live in insane asylums, homes for the deaf, homes for the, uh, for the visually impaired, people who are in prison. So it's really her doing that betters the, um, the condition for those special populations. Public education starts. Um, 1800, there's public school in most of New England. By 1860, almost every state has some form of public education. And that's really because of this guy named Horace Mann. Uh, Horace Mann, who is the head of the Massachusetts State Board of Education, Horace Mann is going to claim that a well-educated population is essential for maintaining democracy. And he establishes a minimum school year. He establishes formalized training of teachers. He's the one who emphasizes the idea of reading, writing, and arithmetic. And then beyond that, another reform movement that's going on is abolition. Abolitionist movements uh, were going as soon as slavery started, but they really get going in 1817 with the formation of the American Colonization Society. There was this movement to compensate slave owners, convince them to let their slaves go, and then return those black slaves to Africa. Um, that didn't really work so well. And in 1831, William Lloyd Garrison, uh, he's a newspaper editor and publisher from upstate New York, he's going to begin publishing The Liberator, which is going to be exclusively dedicated to uh, radical abolitionism. Uh, Garrison and others in his camp, I'll call it, uh, they wanted immediate emancipation, immediate equal rights for blacks. They said that Americans should stop supporting the government completely because the government is immoral and illegal. And it becomes a whole mess. Things get so bad that the American Anti-Slavery Society that was formed in, in 1833, the American Anti-Slavery Society of 1833, it falls apart by 1839 because they can't decide if they want to get involved in government or not. One half of them, led by William Lloyd Garrison, absolutely refuse, while the other half say, yes, we need some sort of political representation. We need to run candidates for president. So when the 1830s end, um, slavery is becoming a pretty big issue, but when we move into the 1840s, everybody at least for a little bit, forgets about slavery because other things are in their mind. Right. That's the main stuff from this week. If you have any questions about anything or if you want to know more, just send me an email. I have a lot more information I can share regarding what you've seen in these two articles. Uh, I also didn't mention anything about the Trail of Tears because I covered that in U.S. History too. But the Trail of Tears is happening at this time. And it's a real mess. Uh, the country is going through some serious growing, growing pains in the 1830s. Um, Monday, which is our normal due day, is the 4th of July. And because of that, this week's work is due on Sunday night. I want to make sure that you see that, you pay attention to that. I have to say something about it so that you know. Uh, this week's work is not due on Monday, July 4th. It's due on Sunday, July 3rd. So please make sure you pay attention to that. All right, 35 minutes. That's plenty of time for me to talk. That's plenty of time for you to listen. So I'll get out of here. I'll let you go. Have a safe and fun 4th of July. 
We'll be back next week. See ya.